it's it's a real kind of honor to speak with you all today. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of a lot of the research that comes out of this uh, group, uh, a lot of the research that get, happens in this room. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, as Trisha mentioned, um, I'm a co-founder of Nava. Uh, we're, you know, what uh, me and maybe some other ex stamen uh, people like to jokingly call government club. Uh, we're working at the intersection of technology, policy, social services. Um, and while there are many, many stories to tell about the work environment of partnering with federal agencies, uh, the work that we're building inevitably has uh, implications across data and identity, um, around issues of consent and privacy, uh, and the power afforded to those with technical skills in this environment. I have a lot more questions than answers here, uh, but if I have a goal, it is to say that uh, the research that happens here is urgent, uh, not abstract. For us as an organization, it is both impossible and irresponsible to pursue our work without acknowledging the volatile climate that we're in, in both in the tech industry and in the government. For me, what sticks out is the rhetoric used in each. <clears throat> Working in government, the most striking differences are what gov Nava is not. Uh, it is not a consumer tech startup. Um, <clears throat> sorry. It is a pretty frothy environment for consumer tech startups, to say the least. Uh, and there is a rhetoric that grows out of this ecosystem where you are constantly pitching for things, where criticism is both unproductive uh, and bad business. Uh, people who get pitched will often hear phrases like, we're just selling into X, but we'll be able to back into the huge Y market. Casper that sells mattresses says things like, they're a mattress company, but really the real opportunity is everything to do with sleep. Uh, Airbnb says, you know, people thought we were about renting houses, but really we're about home. Uh, Netflix's CEO, Reed Hastings, uh, says that Netflix's real business is everything to do with leisure time. Um, it's a bit of an elegant magic trick uh, that adds emotional weight. Uh, kind of standard businesses. Uh, if your valuation is based on future potential, the larger you make the vision sound, the easier it is to stomach the current earnings. And nothing encapsulates the time we're in quite like the new label of the unicorn to describe a startup that has not gone public uh, but has a valuation of more than a billion dollars. A lot of factors have influenced this magical point in our economy. For example, the large percentage of pension funds putting money into venture capital um, in the wake the flattened int interest rates worldwide, the post-bubble restrictions around IPOs. It is a wild moment. Uh, and the label unicorn is particularly stunning. Um, I feel, <laughs> God, that gif. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was trying not to look at it. Um, I, I feel... I feel kind of dumb for pointing this out, but because I feel like somehow everyone already forgot. Uh, but not too long ago, the word unicorn in San Francisco uh, meant a designer who could code. Uh, and before that, it meant a bisexual man or woman who would sleep with heterosexual couples, uh, which just in itself charts San Francisco's fast course <laughs> from the 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 home of sexual experimentation to America's last best hope for capitalism. Um, and I don't, don't know what will happen with these companies, with the Airbnbs, the Theranoses, uh, the Ubers. I do take notes from Josh Koppelman, uh, a venture capitalist in the Valley, who sa said simply, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have a calculator. We now have over 140 billion dollar startups collectively valued at over 500 billion dollars as of, I think, last month. 
Um, for comparison, uh, Apple, the most valuable company in the world, is currently valued at around $600 billion. Um, all this lends to a moment where we are increasingly feeling, but not really able to label, a moment of precarity. To use Frank Duffy's shearing layers model, technology is operating at the pace of fashion, but with the network effects of infrastructure. And there is a similar environment currently in our political stage a heightening of the senses. It is emotionally exhausting and not worth charting all the political statements that have been made in the last few weeks, um, especially in response to the terrorist attacks in Paris. But to sum it up, politicians have fallen back on their own similar rhetoric. You would never hear Reed Hastings, the Netflix CEO, citing individual users' stories, but in politics you'll often hear anecdotes like, meet Joe, uh, or uh, just last week I received a letter from this family in Iowa. Part of the goal of these anecdotes is to make a politician seem more relatable, but part of it is also to create an emotional connection with a cause. My friend Parker describes this as the founder's story. Uh, where a politician will describe their cause, uh, where a politician, NGO uh, leader, they'll describe their cause, an issue of public safety or national security, and they'll stop and turn to you and say, if we could just save one life, it would be worth it. It's a powerful phrase. Uh, one that asks you to ignore scale and focus on the value of a single life. There's a sacredness here that gives these speeches weight. How could you argue against a human life? I hate that phrase. Uh, as humans, we choose narratives over complexity. When we work online these days, when we work at the scale of infrastructure, we're working on systems. Systems are harder to, to describe, harder to hold. Infrastructure runs deep, runs far deeper than the anecdotes that we are able to pass around. It is incredibly hard to talk about systems, to give them the same emotional weight as a narrative about a single life but we can try. For me, the best way I've found to talk about systems is from Keller Easterling, a writer and architect in Princeton, uh, who says that systems have a disposition, a set of characteristics, whether intentional or unintentional. And for me, the disposition of our work in government goes back a long ways the things that have brought about our current environment. The Office of Technology Assessment was a department put together in 1972 under the Nixon administration, governed by a bipartisan board from the House and the Senate. Though small and quiet, the agency had a large presence on many of the great debates around science and technology in the 80s and 90s. In 87 and 90, studies the OTA published uh, concluded that paying for pap smears and mammograms could dra drastically reduce cancer deaths, prompting Congress to require Medicare to do so, saving tens of thousands of lives. In 1994, the OTA published a report that helped assess the Social Security Administration's computer procurement plan uh, and saved the government $360 million. In 1995, however, the OTA became the target of Newt Gingrich's budget cuts, uh, and funding was removed. Uh, the department still exists, uh, but it has no budget. Uh, this is not to say that this was the only place where technical knowledge lived in the government, but it was one of the more dramatic examples 
of the slow removal of research from the public-facing sides of government. There are massive cuts in other departments. From 1993 to 2010, the Government Accountability Office lost more than 2,000 staffers, um, about a third of their uh, workforce. In the same period, the Government Research Service uh, lost about 20% of their staff. And in the last 10 years, there have been many examples of huge IT projects that have been either abandoned or run extremely over schedule or over budget. In 2009, the Social Security Administration, which supports 9 million disabled workers, commissioned a disability claims processing system to replace its reliance on the 54 old systems it had. At the time, over 600,000 claims were awaiting an initial decision, uh, with an average processing time of about four months, while another million cases uh, took over a year and a half to be appealed. The contract ended up being $300 million, uh, awarded to Lockheed Martin, but as of last year, has still not made any progress. Uh, the project has uh, been two to three years from completion for six years. Uh, in 2008, the decennial census scrapped an uh, almost $600 million project that was supposed to create a digital data collection process, but failed to meet requirements. The fallout from this single failed project meant adding, at the last minute, billions of dollars in costs to the 2010 census. This has happened incredibly often, where services that millions of people depend on are never delivered. The Standish Group investing over, investigating over 3,000 government IT projects that had budgets of over $10 million found that only 6% were successful. Uh, the rest were either abandoned, started over, behind schedule, over budget, or drastically below user expectations. This is not to say that the OTA, the GAO, or the CRS could have present, prevented any of these failures, but a lack of proper management and technical support and research has led to a disposition where systems are often unresolved or shelved. No one has a crystal ball here, but we do have calculators. Healthcare.gov was built from 2011 to 2013 uh, for the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Uh, healthcare, it was the result of uh, the work of over 55 contractors, um, none put in an oversight position. When the exchange opened its doors on October 1st in 2013, a little over two years ago, it immediately began experiencing issues. Initially, the issues were seen as the natural effects of overwhelming demand, uh, because there was. Uh, millions of people visited the site on that first day. Uh, but later, people both inside and outside of the government started to understand that the issues that the system were facing were both deeper and more technical than simply demand. In the first 24 hours, uh, healthcare.gov received around 4.7 million visits, but only six people were able to sign up for health insurance. Six people. Uh, <laughs> to understand the scale of this, imagine the entire residential population of Manhattan and Brooklyn combined visiting the site, and only this front row of seats um, being able to enroll. By the end of October, Obama had tapped Todd Park, the White House CTO, to lead the charge for a tech surge, uh, pulling people from the tech industry in to help fix healthcare.gov. Um, 
there were many, many, many people involved. Uh, from Mikey Dickerson, Jeannie Kim, Paul Smith, some of the first responders, to folks within and outside of the government. And while press and others like to continue to refer to it as the tech surge, there was nothing military about it. Uh, this was a quiet effort fought by a small rotating group of people asked to take leaves from the tech industry to help to work with contractors and people at all levels of government, uh, from the call centers to the field offices to CMS to the White House, to help turn the website around. This is, this is us on New Year's Eve. <laughs> uh, none of us asked for this type of work. Um, many took leave from Google or Facebook, other large tech companies. Uh, Randy here. Uh, was in Beijing when he got the call and just went to the airport. <laughs> it was a little bit of a surreal environment. Um, working out of a hotel in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, but little by little, we made it. As Mikey instilled processes to improve responses to outages, our small team began working with CMS to launch improvements to the website. Um, by designing and building bits of the site uh, piece by piece, we ended up dropping the bounce rate on uh, mobile devices by about 30%. Uh, the work that we did uh, in little pieces ended up to, uh, to a, a project to streamline the entire application on healthcare.gov. Working closely with the policy and requirements teams at CMS, uh, to remove questions that only applied in special cases uh, f or for certain households. This tight dialogue and this removal of distance allowed us to create a clearer path, neither overly complex nor naively simple. We reduced the application form from a 76 screen process to a 16 screen one. Uh, and since it's launched, it's launched last year, uh, it's been used by a majority of the people on healthcare.gov. Um, the streamlined application has increased the completion rate by about 50%, uh, and people now complete applications in about half the time. Taken together, it's been a very strange uh, and very surreal journey. It's humbling to feel slightly bound up in news now, the U.S. recently uh, reaching its lowest uninsured rate ever uh, a few months ago. Because there's so much work to be done. We are just a very small piece of, an incredib of the incredible work being done in and around the government. At Code for America, people have been running year-long fellowships, uh, working directly with cities ar across the country trying to improve services at the local level. At ATNF, part of the General Services Administration, folks have been fighting the complexity of procurement and creating experiments and cloud tools, um, running, running work like the micro-purchase agreement they do, did recently, or the Agile Services Blanket Purchase Agreement, <laughs> a model where contractors get approved to be on a list uh, for procurement by building prototypes instead of writing documents. At USDS, led by Mikey Dickerson, they've been hiring people directly into federal agencies, uh, diagnosing issues, following political momentum to shape better infrastructure and articulate better standards. This is the work. Uh, and we are all pushing from different directions towards a very similar goal. But it's very hard to convey, especially to a tech community as frothy as it is. Uh, as an engineer or a designer, if you interview at a place like Facebook or Google or Twitter, the word impact often comes up. Um, interviewers often talk about how every single engineer at Facebook is responsible for X million users, or how every designer at Twitter makes changes that affect X million people. These are real, tremendous scales of impact. 
But words like this now fall flat for us. What statements like this do is conflate numbers for weight. Uh, for us as a team, it is impossible to ignore the weight of the work we're now responsible for. And for good reason. Um, if Facebook goes down, people will complain, likely on Twitter. Um, but, it <laughs> but they are not locked out of services that they depend on. Uh, startups can ignore edge cases that, uh, to bias themselves towards speed, uh, but government cannot. Uh, for us, for Nava, we've felt this sharply as we work with groups outside of healthcare.gov to improve their services and build new interactions with the government. As we build future-facing work that explores this intersection between technology and policy, uh, we've quickly realized the implications. We've found that we need to pause our own process in order to build in a better process, a more holistic process that incorporates research around identity and privacy and consent that our initial technical decisions quickly and immediately have implications on issues of policy. In talking with others um, who have been pulled into this sort of work, people have said that they didn't know this type of work was even possible. Um, for many engineers, this work has made clear the impossibility of being neutral when working in technology. This work has shifted their perspectives on what's important. This has come up over and over again and has become a lasting part of what being involved in this work has done to people. People come, take a leave of absence, uh, work with us for a few weeks or for, for a few months. They go back to their jobs, back to Google, or some other consumer tech company. And they realize their jobs don't feel as nearly as heavy as they once did. Uh, and then they end up getting involved with the government in some way. It's all still very hard to convey. Um, but when I think about the work that we do, when I think about what we do, it's this. Uh, we break people. Uh, we break people so that they cannot ignore the political or ethical implications of their work. Uh, we break people in slow and quiet ways. Then they come back. <laughs> <laughs>